Thank you, Pepe, so much. Uh, it is with great uh, humility that I accept uh, this invitation, which uh, uh, bestows upon me an honor, especially on a day like today, a very big anniversary of um, humanity's capacity to demonstrate immense inhumanity. In our own backyard, we have a uh, genocide unfolding. Today, people in Israel are uh, mourning their dead. And um, as uh, a collective, a human species, Europeans, <laughs> Turks, Greeks, we have some new faith in uh, finding a way of ending what is essentially 76 years of with these weak thoughts in my mind, nevertheless, I take a lot of pleasure seeing all of you here. Um, and I want to thank you for the invitation, the warm welcome, and the kind words. A particular thanks to the Mercator Istanbul Policy Center and the Sabrina University for the fellowship and for the opportunity to speak to my controversial, and some would say weird, hypothesis that um, we no longer live under the capital but we live under a different socio-economic mode of production which I refer to in my latest book, which you kindly mentioned, as techno -fingers. Now, wherever we go, what we see is a triumph of capital. Capital has prevailed everywhere. It has prevailed in warehouses, in factories, in offices, in universities, um, within genetic engineering, in space, so how do I dare claim that capitalism has been killed? By whom? The delicious, ironic answer that I give in the book is that capitalism was killed by its own hand, by capital. If I'm right, the issue is not that which everybody talks about. What will artificial intelligence do to our societies in the near or distant future? The question is, what has already happened to us? Capital, and that is my hypothesis, has become so dominant that it mutated into a variant so toxic, like a virus, that it killed its host, capitalism. This new mutant capital that killed capitalism lives in the proverbial cloud. So that's why I call it cloud capital. Now, what is cloud capital? What makes it so different from the traditional capital? Let's not forget that capitalism came much, much later compared to capital. We had capital in ancient societies. We had capital under feudalism. We had capital. Any produced means of production. Anything we produce in order to use it to produce something else. A fishing rod, an axe, a plow, a steam engine was Capitalism was a very specific socio-economic model of production. But before I get to that, when we say, when I say, when I mention or I define the new form of capital that has upended capitalism as cloud capital, we must not make the mistake to think that it lives in the cloud. It lives down on earth. It comprises networked machines. Network machines. That's totally independent of you. This does not work independently of a network of machines, which includes server farms, cell towers, software, millions of kilometers of underwater optic fiber cables, AI driven algorithms, and of course, the whole network of this machinery becomes essentially an aspect of life which we hardly ever notice, even though it is network machines that are driving our reality as we speak. Now, the difference with traditional capital, which I mentioned before, is that the machines that I'm referring to as our capital and the network that connects them, they are not produced means of production. They are produced 
we have produced them. But they're not mixed production. They are something far more sinister, interesting, fascinating, and perplexing. They are produced means of behavioral modification. Let me give you an example. I don't know how many of you have ever spoken to these machines. Verbally, to Alexa, to Siri, to the Google Assistant. It's fascinating to do this. Especially now with AI, they are becoming very sophisticated. What happens when, let's say, you have an Alexa with you, Paul, sitting on your desk, and you say to it, Alexa, remind me to buy milk tomorrow, order some milk for me, on my behalf, from the supermarket. Or will you say, suggest a book which uh, combines the majesty of Shakespeare with the science fiction of Isaac Asimov, and it suggests one. It looks as if it is your state, but of course it isn't. What is really happening to it? Anyway, Alex, it doesn't exist. It's, it's an interface connecting you to this huge, gigantic network, which lives everywhere. From the ocean floors, to the several farmers between Idaho and the Washington State of the United States in China. Uh, this is what it is. It is a, your portal into this kind of cloud cloud. And it is important what, that, that you train it to know you. You train it essentially not only to know you, but to train you. To train it better to know you. So at some point, I don't know about you, but have you used Spotify? Spotify knows me better than my wife. When it recommends me songs for me to listen, it's almost entirely spot on. I would never hate them. When friends of mine, my best friends, recommend music to me, I often hate it. When Spotify recommends music to me, I never hate it. I may like it and I may love it, but it never goes to the extremity of hating it. Same with Amazon. When Amazon recommends books to me, they're always interesting. Some of them are more interesting than others, but it has never introduced me to a book, Amazon.com, which I thought was beyond my interest. So we train the machine to train us to train it, and it gets better at huh? Have you used TikTok? The first few times I used TikTok, it was showing me boxing matches and really disgusting stuff. Within two weeks, simply by how I was touching the screen when I was scrolling on TikTok, it knew what I liked. Now, if I use TikTok as we speak, it will show me a video of either some theoretical physics, discovery, or a piece of Pink Floyd, which I have never heard being performed in this particular way, or some political discussion, which is interesting. How does it know? Because I train it to train me to train me to train me ad infinitum. Okay? Ah, that is a very new kind of capital. It is a capital in which, with which we have a two-way, infinite regress, dialectical, almost Hegelian relationship. So, that's what cloud capital is. It is machinery that we created to modify our behavior. It is a machine, a piece of capital, which, once it knows us, and once it has gained our confidence, that's a very difficult thing. If you have any person or any machine giving you good advice, advice which you, if you follow, you say thank you. You feel that you've gained, then it is one you'll trust. The next thing that it suggests that you buy, let's say, an electric bicycle, you say, oh well, fine, it's got a very good track record, I'll get it. The probability that you're going to get it is boosted, maximum. So, this is what it does. It trains you to train you to train you, to have the capacity to put into your mind, into your soul desires, which then, and this is the crux. It serves directly bypassing every market. Because Amazon not only makes you want this electric bicycle, but sells it to you. It doesn't produce it. That's why it's not a produced means of production. It's a produced means of behavior modification. Somebody else, a factory, you know, another capitalist, or even a small workshop produces an electric bicycle. Again, you get it, not from the marketplace. Right? It bypasses the marketplace. 
and Amazon charges a rent, I call it the cloud rent, of up to 30 or 40 percent of the asking price to the entrepreneur, to the capitalist, to the collective, whatever workshop that has made that buy some good you purchase. Meanwhile, in the factories and the warehouses, where waged proletarians, waged laborers, work under increasingly precarious conditions. The same algorithm that has put desires into your mind after you train them to do it, the same algorithm, exactly the same algorithms. Those algorithms are deployed usually on digital devices strapped on the workers' arms to tell them what to do. If you go to an Amazon warehouse where the electric bicycle is being packaged to be sent to you, you will see workers with these machines here telling them where to go, pick it up, where to put it, it monitors them, it knows exactly how many minutes that, that particular worker has spent in the toilet. <laughs> and, 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 this, I don't know whether you know this, this is a fact, I can demonstrate it, there is proof of this. The same AI technology, which is being used by other forms of cloud capital in pharmaceutical companies, to devise and to design antibiotics that are capable of killing bacteria, which are lethal to human beings, a fantastic accomplishment of the human spirit. We have created algorithms that can design antibiotics, which the human mind cannot. The same algorithm is used by Amazon to predict in which warehouse there is a heightened probability of unionization in order to shut down that, that warehouse or fire the workers before they even unionize. The same algorithm that creates the antibiotic. I started by saying that wherever we turn, we stumble on the triumph of capital. But it is cloud capital that is the real winner, not capital. It is amazing how it performs. It performs at once five rows that no other capital, equipment, machine, has ever performed before. As I said, I'm summing up, but adding as well. First of, all, first of all, cloud capital grabs our attention. Second, it manufactures our desires. You may say at this point, I'm going to say, advertise as I've always done it. I use the example of Don Draper, Issues, fictional character in Mad Men, and you will see a great television program by CBS or you. Uh, Don Draper, very smart, half drunk advertiser, comes up with amazing ideas um, of posters and television advertisements and radio ads that would make you want to buy a McDonald's, even if you don't want a McDonald's or need a McDonald's. But then you would have to go to the McDonald's to get And it's one way from Don Draper to you. He does. It's successful, it creates hunger for McDonald's, you go to McDonald's and buy it. But here, and this is the third accomplishment, this is the third function of cloud capital, it sends directly to you, as I said before, outside any traditional markets, that which is going to satiate the desires that the same machine has created in your own soul or mind, whether it is the desires of you. Fourthly, it drives proletarian labor inside workplaces. And fifthly, it elicits massive free labor from all of us. Because, let's face it, when you are using Twitter, if you use Twitter, or Instagram, or TikTok, you upload something, or Facebook, you may enjoy it, you may have your own reasons. It is totally voluntary, nobody is forcing you to do it. And yet, you are not being paid for it. You are performing free labor, which does what? It adds to the stock of the cloud capital of that platform. Let me give you a simple example. Um, when Elon Musk bought Twitter, I wanted to get out of it. I know how to it. Why? Because I have 1.2 million followers. If I go to Blue Sky, I will have 10. Not million, but a billion. Coming from my figure, fingers of my glass. Okay. So every time I tweet, 
and I get a follower, and that follower tweets, and I follow her or him. Right? We are creating more cloud capital for Elon Musk. Same with Instagram. Same with Amazon.com. The moment you add a review of a book on Amazon, or you add a review on some a pair of binoculars that you purchase on Amazon, you're adding with your own free labor to the capital stock, the cloud capital stock of Amazon.com. Is it therefore surprising that the owners of this cloud capital, whom I call cloudalists in the book, to separate them from traditional capitalists, they're capitalists too, except that they own cloud capital. So I call them cloudalists. Is it any wonder that they're more powerful than Henry Ford could ever be? Or even Rupert Burton, the magnate of the press and media empire? Hang on, I hear you say. What is the great difference between, let's say, Chet Bezos and Henry Ford, whom I mentioned? Aren't they both an example of monopoly capitalists, of a magnet, who is a megalomaniac? Remember, Henry Ford was determined that everybody would be driving the Model T, his own car. He was determined that cities would remove their tramways and their public transport. And he was successful in influencing politics so that tramways in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and so on, they were ripped up so that his cars would dominate the streets of these great cities. He bought a newspaper. Well, Jeff Bezos has bought a newspaper in order to, supposedly, to save the Washington Post. But a lot of people working for Washington Post have told me because he wants to push for his agenda um, in the same way that Henry Ford wanted. So what is the difference between these two men? They're big capitalists, huge egos, and a lot of capital that gives them, bestows upon them, gigantic powers. Well, there is a fantastic and hugely important difference between Henry Ford and, uh, and Jeff Bezos. Henry Ford wanted to buy the products that were coming out of his factory, out of his production line for this. And he wanted to buy the car that his factory made. Jeff Bezos doesn't make anything. What is the success of Jeff Bezos? That he has this cloud capital. Okay, so Henry Ford has capital, which is what? Machines making machines that he wants you to buy. Jeff Bezos has machines that don't make anything except for the capacity to capture you, me, and millions of producers of physical products in one digital platform. I call it the cloud digital. Because once you are in there, once you, let's say, you are a publisher, and you did quite well by publicizing your articles, your books in Amazon.com, you become addicted to Amazon.com because the cash flow is huge. Most newspapers and all publishers in the United States make a lot of money when they enter Amazon.com. Okay? But the more often and the greater the capacity of Amazon.com to attract us who wanted to read the news, who wanted to buy the devices, who wanted to buy the binoculars, who wanted to buy the CDs and the DVDs. And once we are all in there, we have a very strange environment. Think about it. What is Amazon.com? People mistakenly say that it is a market. It is not a market. A market is by definition decentralized. This is what Adam Smith, the founder of economics, loved about the market. That it is not controlled by anyone. That it is decentralized. That everybody is stumbling upon everybody else in a haphazard, spontaneous manner. Friedrich von Hayek, the great guru of neoliberalism, he went one step further beyond Adam Smith. Adam Smith considered the market to be a very useful tool because it's decentralized. Hayek went further and he effectively gave divine powers to the market, that the market will always know best in the same way that, you know, a religious fundamentalist would think of the divinity. 
But for Hayek, it only knew well because nobody controlled it. Because it was, as he called it, spontaneous order. Well, there's no spontaneous order in Amazon.com. None. But there's people would say, but Yannis Anton, is it the same as going to a shopping mall that has been bought? Every single shop is bought by one person? No, it's not. If you and I walk into a shopping mall, let's say a shopping mall that belongs to one person who owns all the, shop, the shops, it is still not Amazon.com. Let me explain why. You and I walk inside the shop, right? You go in front of the shop selling what? Shoes. We see the same shoes. You and I have a little discussion about the shoes that we see. Do you like the shoes? No, not really. No, they're great. Hmm? We can even organize a consumer boycott. Let's not ever buy shoes from this shop. In Amazon.com, the moment you enter, if you and I enter together, that's it, you have a lot of my laptop and I type. Um, Binoculars, right? Or why I have this thing about binoculars? Or electric bicycles. You will get a different list of sellers from me because the algorithm knows you intimately. We have trained it, you have trained it, you it knows me. And it will match us with different sellers on the basis of a statistical model, an algorithm that maximizes the likelihood that Jeff Bezos is going to get to extract the most cloud rent from each of these sellers. And you and I cannot talk. When we are, when we are on Amazon.com, we cannot talk to one another. We are like a panopticon, if you remember from Jeremy Beckham, the vile idea of a prison that it looks like a panopticon. It's like a panopticon belonging to Jeff Bezos. And do you know what Amazon.com is? This is a rhetorical question. It is the wet dream of the Soviet Union and the KGB. Because it replaces the market with an algorithm that matches consumers to produce those what cost plan wanted to do this algorithm. Amazon has done it, except that this whole system is owned by one man who has the capacity to extract huge cloud rents from the producers and free labor from the rest of us. That's why I call the rest of us cloud serfs, the capitalist producers, faster capitalists, and the workers who work in the Amazon warehouses or on the production line. I call them cloud pros or proletarians. Ladies and gentlemen, this is no longer capitalism. And let me give you a quantitative explanation of this statement. Every traditional capitalist conglomerate, take Volkswagen in Germany, Alstom in France, General Electric in the United States, every, every conglomerate, there is a homeomorphism there. If you look at their books, their accounting books, about plus or minus, but not much, 85% of their revenues is paid out in salaries and wages to the workers, to the middle management, to the managers, to the CEO, and so on. About 85%. Do you know what percentage of Facebook's or Meta's revenues are paid to salaries, including high salaries? 1%. 1. Which raises Serious questions. Where does the rest come, go from, come from? It comes from your free labor. Because who produces the cloud capital of Facebook? The people who use it, the users, and then they get paid. <laughs> okay? And instead, the ownership of this cloud capital allows the cloud owners, the owners of cloud capital, essentially to extract up to 30% of GDP, of national income, and take it out of the sector of low income, which is catastrophic for an already unstable macroeconomic system. Why did Elon Musk buy Twitter? <coughs> when I read the analysis in uh, the Washington Post, owned by Jeff Bezos, who doesn't like Elon Musk, that Elon Musk is just a madman who simply you know, is a bully and a spoiled brat who just wants to inf infect the rest of the world with his stupid ideas. Yes, maybe. But he didn't have to buy Twitter to do that. He was doing that before he owned Twitter. He tweeted courses of idiocies. Elon Musk has proven that he's not an idiot. The SpaceX is not, was not a simple enterprise to set up, nor was Tesla. Whatever you may think about him, especially if you listen to what he said, he wanted an everything app. 
What he wanted was, you see, he had managed to electrify cars and to make electric cars drive. He had managed to take over from NASA uh, and from the Europeans and from the Russians uh, the, the, the space race, to win it, essentially to produce starships that can actually go there, come back, and land on their waters. Uh, not, not, not a mean feat, right? Um, he didn't have cloud cover. And Twitter gave him this option. He gave him this portal by which to connect his Tesla cars, his um, Starlink satellites, with cloud capital that taps in all of us. To impress upon you why I think that it is important to conceptualize this great transformation from capitalism to what I call the feudalism. Why am I talking about the great transformation? Because when we went from feudalism to capitalism, essentially we shifted from, from societies where power stemmed from the land. Anyone who owned land, landowners, had the power to extract rent. And rent became the source of wealth. All the cathedrals came out of accumulated rent. Huh? And then you have this great transformation, as Carl Polanyi described it, to capitalism, where the great asset to have was no longer land, but it was machinery, it was capital, it was produced means of production. And what you collected by having it, owning it, was not land, but a temporary profit. So capitalism happened when we shifted from land to capital, and suddenly all our activities went through markets that yielded profits, and profits overwhelmed rent as a source of wealth accumulation, as capitalism. What I'm saying now is that, today, through this book, is that we have another great transformation. It is no longer capital, traditional capital, that yields power and wealth. It is the ownership of cloud capital. And cloud capital demolishes the two main pillars of capitalism. Markets have been replaced by platforms like Alibaba, like Amazon.com, like Airbnb, like Google, which are not markets, they are digital fiefdoms, that grant the power, extracted power, to their owners of cloud capitalists to extract rent, you can go back to rent, from profit to rent. But it's not going back really, it's going forward in a dystopian direction. Because cloud rent is very different to land rent, to ground rent. And just to wrap it up, because I'm very much looking forward to having you here today, which is always the more interesting part of the discussion. Because I, I've heard myself speak a lot, but not you. <laughs> uh, let me just finish off with another controversial statement. Why is there a Cold War, new Cold War, between the United States and China? My argument in the book, which is a whole chapter dedicated to this, is because we live in the age of cloud capital. If I'm right that ownership of cloud capital is what yields massive power, and no longer traditional capital, which two countries in the world have it? The United States and China. Europe is not. Is there a Europe, a European Google, Meta? Africa. Zero. Africa? Asia? Except Chinese? No. You have Big Tech. Silicon Valley, and you've got the Chinese Big Tech, which is more advanced than the American. Not technologically, but in terms of the power to extract rents. Why am I saying that? In the United States, you have the East Coast and the West Coast, we all know that, right? Allow me to make it a bit more prosaic. We have Wall Street and Big Tech. They do not like each other. They cannot cooperate because Wall Street will never allow Apple or Google to share Wall Street's rents from the capacity effectively to print the American dollar. Because the American dollar is not printed by the Fed, don't have this illusion, it's printed by Wall Street. 95% of all dollars come out of the private banks who control it. And they don't want, do not want to share this power with um, Big Tech. In China, because they're all under the Chinese Communist Party, their big tech and their big finance are one. If you've ever been to China and you've downloaded WeChat, 
It's an application that we in the West we cannot have. We don't have and we cannot have because the bankers will not let the big tech cloud is to have it. It's a digital app which allows you to make free payments in one, of course, in the Chinese currency. That is a clear and present danger to the dominance of the United States dollar payment system internationally and that monopoly of transactions, the dollar system, is the only reason why the United States remains dominant in a world where the United States manufacturing capacity has gone to nothing and where the only thing that allows the hegemony of the United States to be replicated is its capacity essentially to make sure that the profits of Turkish business, of Chinese business, of German business, of French business must be recycled through Wall Street and through the dollar system. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to bring your interest in uh, my outrageous hypothesis and I'm very much looking forward to your questions.